We have a lot to cover today, and we continue in our series on apologetics. And um, I, I pray that um, as we're studying this, especially as um, it is made by God's grace relevant to what is going on, and we are living in a world of chaos. We are watching the fiber of society degrade right before our eyes. I'm going to give examples from current events here in the, in the, in the message. But if you don't know Christ as your Savior, it is now time to make your calling and election sure. Now, most people don't start the sermon with an appeal, but I will. It is time to make your calling and election sure for soon and very soon. We are going to see the King. Jesus is about to return. Our scripture reading, taken from Joshua uh, chapter 1 and verse 8, This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then shalt thou have good success. Our message today, and a continuation of our series on apologetics, is the law and morality. The law and morality. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word. Once again, Lord, I ask that you make me just a nail upon the wall, a rusty, sorry nail, Lord. But upon that nail, Lord, I ask that you hang a portrait of Jesus Christ. Lord, let Eric Walsh not be seen or heard today. Instead, Father, let us hear a word from the throne room of grace. This is our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. All right, so our series on apologetics, remember apologetics is the ability, as Peter says, to give a defense for what you believe. There's a time coming when the people of God are going to face persecution and no one is going to stand and be persecuted for what they do not understand or believe properly. So now is the time to begin to study these topics. And today, our, our story comes from the book of Matthew, the 19th chapter, one of my favorite stories of Jesus. Matthew 19 and verse 16 says, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good sh thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? This young man had it all, and he wanted to make sure that he wasn't just going to live a good life in this life, he wanted to make sure he's going to live a good life in the next one. His private jet sat at the airport and his Bentley was in his garage. All right, they didn't have jets and Bentleys back then. But you get my point. He was a man of great means and everything and anything he wanted he could have, except he did not have the assurance of eternal life. Because riches cannot buy that. Even the wealthiest in this world, when faced with death, must ask the question, will they live again? Jesus said unto him, why callest thou me good? This is Jesus calling him out for trying to butter Jesus up by being kind to him. There's none good but one, that is God. He says, but if you will enter into life, keep the commandments. If you will enter into life, keep the commandments. That is what Christ says. The young man says, which commandments? Jesus answers him, you shall do no murder. You shall not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. Did somebody get that one? Honor your father and your mother. Thou shalt love your neighbor as yourself, which is actually a summation statement to all the uh, commandments that Christ just told him to keep. He summarizes it by saying, you need to love your neighbor as yourself. The young man is pleased with this pronouncement. The young man said unto him, all these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? This is an interesting question. Jesus told him what he needed to do to obtain eternal life, and he still felt inadequate. It wasn't a, even when he, when he panned his mind, well, I've always been nice to mama and daddy. I, 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 I've never stolen anything. He didn't have to steal anything. He was rich. He never killed anyone, never committed adultery. And in his mind, he said, okay, I should be all right. But somewhere deep down inside, he still felt that he was coming up short. So he asked Jesus the tough question, 
What lack I yet? Jesus said unto him, If you will be perfect, go and sell that you have and give it to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. If you're going to be perfect, give away what you have. Why? You got to see this thing in the story. You see, Jesus' summation statement that you should love your neighbor as yourself is really the test, not the, the commandments that precede it. When Jesus says, listen, if you, you want to be perfect, if you want to show that you actually are living to the spirit of the law and not just the letter, I want you to sell everything, give it to the poor, because then you would show that you love your neighbor. Then Jesus gives him, I think, also a tough part of the command that Jesus gives him is, and come and do what? Follow me. Do you think the rich man wanted to hang out with the guy who said, foxes have their holes and the birds have their nests, but the son of man has not place to lay his head? You think he wanted, to, I remember once we, the, the church, uh, one of the church schools went camping um, on the coast in California. And I'm not a camper. You know, I'm just not, that's not what I do. So I went and they put me in a tent on the beach in central California. Anybody from California knows that's a, that's a mistake. The sand was ice cold, with breeze and bugs. It was a weird thing. And as I was laying there freezing in the middle of the night, I said, this, is, this, this won't happen next night. I said, I'm going to go get a hotel. And sure enough, I got up the next morning, left everybody on the beach and went and got a hotel. And people were like, oh, he's soft. You know, and then all the rest of the fathers, they, I looked in the hotel, about three or four of them had joined me. They had also gotten rooms. This rich man didn't want to have to sleep on the beach. He didn't want to have to wonder where he was going and wander Galilee and, and all of Judah. He was used to a very structured life. And let me tell you something. One of the things about the commandments and morality is it's not just that you do good to others. It's not just that you keep the law. It is that you follow Christ. Well, look at the, 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 how this story ends. Matthew 19 and verse 22. But when the young man heard that saying, he, was a, he, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Here, Jesus shows you the power of the commandments, the power of the law when you see it in its spirit. The reality is that this, this young man would choose material goods over Christ, which means he fails in every way that he thought he passed the test. He left. His disciples later on, we won't get into it today, but they say, listen, if, if the rich can't be saved, who can be saved? Because according to the Jewish way of thinking, uh, um, they had a gospel of prosperity kind of mindset. If you were wealthy, it was because you were in favor with God. It was because God looked uh, favorably upon you. So clearly they were closer to salvation than those who had little. When the disciples heard that the rich man wasn't able to make it in, they said, who then can be saved? And Jesus said, with man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So let's talk about the Ten Commandments. That's what we're going to talk about today. Well, the Ten Commandments, there are two divisions of the Ten Commandments. The way we see it, you can see there's always two pieces of stone. But if you took the Fifth Commandment and moved it to the right, you'd have the first four, which are, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. And it also says that thou shalt not bow down to them. So there are a whole class of professed Christians who still bow to idols. This is a forbidden thing in the Ten Commandments. The third one, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. I want to submit to you that this commandment is one of the ones most broken. And if you watch almost anything on television, one of the recurring themes, I, I read something once that said that the, the, the most frequented curse words in all of Hollywood are the name of God. The fourth one we're going to deal with in a few weeks, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And it's honor your father and your mother, that the, your days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. It speaks to a respect for the elders, a respect for authority. Thou shalt not kill. And it doesn't just mean you shouldn't kill someone physically. It means you ought not kill them emotionally either. Thou shalt not commit adultery. And this is do not adulterate God's ideal for sex 
uh, and marriage and sexuality. It says, uh, the, the eighth one says, thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. You shouldn't lie or be deceitful. And the last one is that thou shalt not covet. Ten commandments. The first four align with our relationship to God. The last six align with our relationship to our fellow men. Right? That's what, how the, the, the commandments are divided up. The interesting thing about the fourth commandment is that it actually plays into both sides. Because on the one hand, you keep the, the, the fourth commandment in honor of God, but you also make sure that you don't cause someone else to work. Neither your manservant nor your maidservant. So how does Jesus look at this? Matthew chapter 22, verse 35 through 40 says, Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, You should love the Lord your God with all your heart. That's the first four commandments. And now, and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. That is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And we know that this is the case because when we were reading about the rich young ruler, at the end of giving all of those commandments that he needed to keep to gain eternal life, Jesus summarizes them by saying, love your neighbor as yourself. So here we get the idea, the two parts of it. And we live in a world that no longer wants to believe that there is a moral law. There are no more moral absolutes. So first, let's define sin. What is sin? Some people don't believe there's sin anymore, that it's what you believe is right or wrong determines whether or not it is sin. First John chapter 3 and verse 3 says, And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Look at verse 4. Whosoever commits sin transgress also the law. What is sin? For sin is the transgression of the law. That means that when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, there had to have been a what? A law. The Ten Commandment law, when it says that Lucifer sinned in heaven, that means there had to be a law where? Even in heaven. The Ten Commandments predate this world. The principles upon which these laws are defined, if sin is the transgression of the law, the law had to have existed when Lucifer sinned, when Adam sinned. So watch this. Romans 3 and verse 20 says, For by the law is the what? It's the knowledge of sin. You would not know sin if there was no law. Romans 7 and verse 7, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? So some people say, well, the law is sin. Is the law sin? It says, God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Wherefore, look at this, the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and what? And good. But there are those who are working tirelessly to either alter God's law or remove it altogether. God's law is just. God's law is good. Without the law, there is chaos, just as in the case of the natural law. So I'm going to show you that the laws are being changed. This on the left is the, is the biblical Ten Commandments. And if you've ever read a Catholic catechism, on the right is how the law has been changed in there. First, the second commandment has been removed, right? So you say it's totally taken out so that the fourth commandment becomes the third. Remember to keep holy the Lord's day. We'll talk more about that in a few weeks. But the second commandment is removed. And if you just think about, and am I, 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 I love my Catholic brothers and sisters. In fact, my, my grandfather's cousin or, or one of his relatives is the Archbishop of the island of Jamaica. So um, um, I, I have many Catholics in my family, but it doesn't change what has been changed. When you look at this, the third commandment then becomes what is the fourth. And that second one is removed. And when I'll never forget, when I visited the Vatican myself, I was in awe at the amount of prostration and prayers being made to idols. The second commandment, some argue, is only an expansion of the first. That's why it can be removed. But there are two different things. You can bow to an idol and not say it is God. You can pray to an idol and say that it is not God. And that is forbidden in the second commandment. 
And of course, in order to make it still be 10, the last commandment that thou shalt not covet is split into two parts, that you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, you shall not covet your neighbor's goods. And what you find when you study the words of the scripture is that that ninth commandment is actually under the seventh commandment. And I'll show you that in a second. So there's no reason to split the Ten Commandments because that ninth commandment in the catechism is covered in, a, in the spirit of the law when you look at the seventh. We'll get to that in a second. Psalm chapter 19 says this. The law of the Lord is what? It's perfect. Converting the soul, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The role of the Ten Commandments for the Christian is that it functions as a mirror. As I hold up the perfect law of God, I see my own inadequacies. And what I learn is no matter how hard I work, just like the rich young ruler, to try and keep the law and be perfect, I always come up somewhat short. I always ask the question, what lack I yet? So the law allows us to see something critical if you're going to be saved. It allows you to see your inadequacy. And it is based on that inadequacy when you're facing a perfect law that you can make the determination that it is time now to find the one who can make up the gap. The one who fills in the void, whose righteousness covers our inability to be perfectly righteous. Because the scripture says even our righteousness is as filthy rags. In other words, even if we are behaving at our best, we still need the righteousness of Christ. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14 says it like this. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and do what? And keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. The whole duty of man is obedience to God. It is to trust righteousness is by faith and obey because it is when you understand that righteousness comes from faith, it transforms the way you live. I say it all the time. A mango tree does not make mangoes to prove it's a mango tree. A mango tree produces mangoes because it's a mango tree. In other words, a Christian bears good fruit because he's a Christian, not to prove he's a Christian. 1 John 3. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. How does Christ make up the gap? Here it is. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that does righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. What? So how do you gain victory over sin? You abide in Christ. That's why the hymn says to turn your eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful face. Because when you do, the things of this world grow strangely dim. And let me tell you something. The key to gaining victory over sin is not to constantly look at your sin or look at your past or beat yourself up with your mistakes. It is to turn your eyes and look to Christ Jesus. For by beholding him, you will become changed. You want to stop behaving the way you behave? Look to Jesus. Pattern after his life. 1 John 3 continues. And you know what? That he was manifested to take away our sins. Um, uh, he Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, verse 9. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. But this is the message that ye heard from the beginning. That we should do what? Love one another. So how has the devil, so it showed you one thing, he wants to change the law. We'll come back around to that a little bit. But the other thing that the devil has done is he introduced concepts that would negate God's law. One of them is the concept of moral relativism. Have you ever heard this? In fact, I learned this in school. And what it taught is that really there is no absolute right or wrong. It's all circumstantial. And one of the ways that they justify it is culture. They say, well, in one culture it might be wrong, and in another culture it's not. And so we can't put our Western ideals on the world. One writer said it like this, moral relativism, the destroyer of all freedom. Moral relativism is the ideology or religion that objective morality does not exist inherently to nature. 
and, the, and that right and wrong are subjective constructs which human beings may in, invent and arbitrate according to time, location, circumstance, or preference. In truth and reality, morality and, and reality, morality is objective. Rights can never become wrongs, and wrongs can never become rights at any place or time, regardless of how many people believe or wish for it to be so. Moral relativism is how they launched something called the sexual revolution. Now, we're going to get a little bit deep. This is looking at the, the, the seventh commandment and what actually was being done. So there was a guy, this is Alistair Crowley. I won't get too deep into it today, but Alistair Crowley, um, uh, his mother said he was the wickedest man who ever lived. And he said he did not want to know of some mythical devil. He wanted to, he wanted to um, serve him and be like his top official in the world. He was uh, from the United Kingdom and he believed in everything from tantra and sex magic. He, he was a great influencer of people. And he developed some very twisted thoughts and ideas that have permeated society. And we know he's deep in society because you can see this is the Beatles um, Sgt. Pepper Lonely Hearts Club Band album. And there he is right on the cover of the album. Right? Because they were trying to show you. Uh, he said his name was the Beast. That's what his slide says, follow the Beast. He, he called himself the Beast 666 himself. And one of his calling cards, we're talking about the law and morality today, one of his calling cards was um, that um, do as thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. His calling card was you can do whatever you want. That is the law. He only describes that you be careful in how you do whatever you want. You take precautions, prophylaxis against negative consequences to doing whatever you want. And so where does it pop up? It still pops up. This is arguably the greatest rapper of all time, a guy named Jay-Z. Most of you probably don't know him. Um, and he says here, do what thou wilt. He actually has the words of Aleister Crowley on his sweater. Because this has permeated our society to this depth that you should just do whatever you want. And his influence influenced a guy named Kinsey, Alfred Kinsey, at Indiana, Indiana University. I won't get too much into Kinsey, except Kinsey uh, conducted some pretty twisted um, experiments and and said that children were sexual creatures and all kinds of very twisted things that I think are plaguing our society altogether. But I'll skip Kinsey and say that this guy, Hugh Hefner, came and was one of also one of Crowley's um, students and one of the people influenced by him. And this is what he says. Part of the sexual revolution is bringing rationality to sexuality. Because when you don't embrace sexuality in a normal way, you get the twisted kinds and the kinds that destroy lives. So he said, listen, in his morality, the reason we made Playboy magazine, the reason we had a Playboy mansion and did all the stuff that we did was so that we could allow people to freely express themselves so they wouldn't do dangerous forms of, of sexual behavior that might hurt people. You see what happens when you start to apply moral relativism? He is talking as if he's taking some high ground. But look at what actually happened. What happens when we violate the law of the living God? Hugh Hefner, A Revolution. This article uh, is about the um, A&E documentary on, on him after he died. What is the legacy of Hugh Hefner? Infamous libertine and hedonist, groundbreaking publisher and free speech warrior, culture changer, vampire, monster, all of the above. This is what the, the, the person writing about this documentary says. I didn't see the documentary, but I thought this would be eye-opening. Right off the bat, in A&E's docuseries, Secrets of Playboy, one of Hefner's ex-girlfriend, Holly Madison, says the legacy dust isn't settled yet. He died in 2017 at 91, escaping the Me Too tornado of takedowns of other powerful Hollywood men. Nevertheless, Secrets of Hollywood, uh, Secrets of Playboy, now compromises 12 hours of people talking about Hefner and the Playboy empire he created. Look at this. And in the none too flattening terms, they're going to make more episodes, Scores, look at this, scores of Hefner's girlfriends, friends, employees, and colleagues explain how they chose to embrace the lifestyle he flaunted before America, uh, many uh, blue noses, and how they eventually realized too late it was all a soul-destroying sham. That is a secular writer writing about what the ultimate consequences of the whole Playboy legacy is. I'm going to read that last part again. It was a soul-destroying sham. 
They want you to think that what they offer you is freedom and liberty. They want you to think that if you follow the ways of the world, what you get is an advantage. But as the wrecked souls laid and strewn across uh, 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 the shoulders of life, of the road of life, that tell a different story, that in fact what he offered was soul-destroying. And I don't even know if that person understands the full theologic weight of what they said. Here are the most disturbing allegations in the new Playboy docuseries. And so they, they went through, and they, they, if you go online, you can see it, but they, you know the, 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 what they claim, it is jaw-dropping. This man hailed as a hero would have done some of the things he did. Some said that they have been liberated, right, through this sexual revolution. But here's what the Bible says. 1 Samuel 15, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry, as the sin of witchcraft. And what we have seen instead um, is that when there is no law, things, bad things begin to happen. You have a whole Me Too movement that has arisen because we have created a, a, a society where sex is all anyone thinks about. Now, well, these are the ramifications of no law. This is the increase in STDs. Year over year, every year, we break the record from the year before. That is the direction in which America is going. Here is um, the children born with syphilis. It has quadrupled in four years or five years. When the law of God is, is, is turned away from, when it is ignored, things begin to change rapidly. This is an interesting take. This is um, Catherine du, de, de, de Nouvet. I don't speak French. I can't pronounce her name right. It's a French actress. And she says in a letter that a bunch of French actresses wrote, the letter echoed this statement. Instead of helping women in this frenzy to send these male chauvinist pigs to the abattoir, the slaughterhouse, it actually helps the enemies of sexual liberty. Look at this. Religious extremists and the worst sort of reactionary. She says, and because what is she recognizing? When you have a movement like this, it speaks to the fact that if you followed God's way, you wouldn't have such need for such a movement. The movement exists because we have turned society into a big hookup game. And so people are easily offended, and now you've got this, this, this other revolution going in the other direction. So we know that these things actually destroy. We've, we've seen what happens with pornography, how it rewires the brain to a more juvenile state. It shrinks the brain. One study found actually shrinks the frontal lobe of the brain, and yet this is what they are bathing young men's minds in now. Matthew 5 and verse 27 says it like this. You have heard that it was said by them of old time that thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Jesus says in verse 29, If your right eye offend you, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is profitable for you that one of your members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. The spirit of the law says it's not just what you actually do, it's your thoughts that become corrupted. Because out of the thoughts is where behavior comes. So even if you're able to bind your behavior, but you never lasso your thoughts, you still violate God's law. Jesus didn't come to do away with the law. He clarified the law. He made the law more clear. And this is one of the cases where he does it. And you can see its impact on our society. If there is no morality, if there is no right or wrong, if everything goes and all the laws are thrown out of the window, then there are consequences. Manuscript 43a, if the inhabitants of the world had obeyed the law of God, instead of hearing reiterated from the pulpits that God has no law, that God has no commandments, and if the parents should educate their children as Christ enshrouded in the billowy cloud gave the direction to Moses to give to Israel, we should not hear of the thefts, the robberies, the murders, and our jails be filled, the prisons filled with criminals because of the crime and wickedness that prevails in our world to such a fearful extent. 
She says, now we would say, let us love God and keep his commandments. But this is the whole duty of man. If there is no law, there's consequences. You remember in the Bible, it gives, why was the world destroyed before the flood? Violence, murder. Their appetite was so in control that they would just take what they wanted, touch people they shouldn't touch, grab stuff that wasn't theirs. In the time of the judges, it would come back around and every time it would be said, and every man did what he saw was right in his own mind. So the second question, when we talk about the law, is does the Bible say that the law is done away with? There are many who would say that the law, the Ten Commandments, are no longer binding for Christians. So are we under grace and not under the law? Galatians chapter 2 says this, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. And some people say, well, that's the case. Then we don't really have to keep the Ten Commandments anymore. We're not justified by the law. That's because they don't understand justification. Justification happens when I believe Christ. It's not something that I actually do. The law couldn't justify no longer, than, no more than a mirror can make you beautiful. Right? You can look in the mirror all day and all night. You're not going to walk away looking any different. You're justified because you believe in Christ Jesus. Now watch this. Romans chapter 6 and verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under the law, but under grace. So people say, listen, I don't have to keep the law. I'm under grace. What then? This is what Paul's response is. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. What is sin? It is the transgression of the law. So if Paul is saying, uh, shall we sin? He's saying, shall we transgress the law because we're not under the law? But under grace, God forbid. No, you're not supposed to violate the, the law because you're under grace. He says, know ye not to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey. His servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Now watch this. Where this gets interesting is people think that grace makes it so they no longer have to keep the law. Paul says, you don't want to sin because you're under grace. And the way that I look at it is, if you were convicted in a court of murder and sent to prison for the rest of your life or facing the death penalty, and 10 years later, the governor comes along and grants you grace, he actually um, grants you um, a pardon and allows you to go free. Does that mean when you get free, you should go back and commit murder? Grace doesn't say you now have a right to break the law. Grace simply says that the God of the universe has forgiven you for what you've done. That you no longer have to pay the penalty for your violations of the law. That's grace and mercy. Romans 6 and verse 18, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of what? Righteousness. You're no longer a servant of, the, of, of, of sin. You're a servant now of what? Of righteousness. That's what happens as you come to know God. Romans chapter 3, 28. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. So some people say, well, then I don't have to keep the law. And Paul responds, do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we do what? We establish the law. So, some say, well, the law is Moses' law, and we don't need to keep that. Um, and so they read Colossians 2, and they say, so this is the Moses' law versus the Ten Commandments. Colossians 2, 13, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having, having forgiven you all trespasses? And this is where they get it. They say, well, blotting out the handwriting of ordinance that were against us, that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. And they say, well, the law has been nailed to the cross. You no longer have to keep it. Can you nail stone to, to, a, to wood? It was handwriting. Did, did Moses write the Ten Commandments? 
the, the Old Testament is clear. God wrote the, the Ten Commandments with his what? With his own finger in stone, meaning it was permanent. The handwriting were the laws of Moses that governed how they lived to protect them from violating the Ten Commandments. That was nailed to the cross because it pointed forward. Verse 15, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink or in respect of a holiday or of any new moon or of the Sabbath day. So they say, well, we don't need to keep the Sabbath. We don't need to keep all these things. But verse 17 makes it clear, church, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. The Ten Commandments preexisted sin so they couldn't be a foreshadowing of what Christ was coming to do. The law of Moses, when we studied the sanctuary, all of the, the sacrifices, all of the rituals, all of that was pointing forward to the cross. When Jesus came and died, the veil in the temple rent from the top to the bottom. They say it was four inches thick, no hand, it just ripped by itself. Because at that point, all of those services, all of the laws governing that service were of no more effect because Christ had fulfilled all those laws. But it doesn't take away the Ten Commandments. Ephesians 2.15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. What the scripture teaches is that Jesus came in the flesh and he kept the law. When you accept him, you accept the fact that he was perfect and righteous. He didn't do away with the law. He fulfilled the law. So, how do you know that these things are different? This is from Amazing Facts Bible Study Guide. And I didn't want to go through all the verses, so I just copied their chart. But you can see here, you, it was called the law of Moses. The, God's law is called the law of the Lord. It was called the law contained in ordinances, in Ephesians 2.15. This is called the royal law, James 2.8. When written by Moses in a book, were written by God on stone, placed in the side of the ark, placed inside the ark. Big difference. The law of Moses never went inside the Ark of the Covenant. It ended at the cross. Luke 6, 7, 16, 17 tells us that uh, the Ten Commandment law will stand forever. Points out sin. It's not burdensome. Judges all people. It's spiritual. It, Psalms 19, 7 says, is perfect. Once you understand this, you understand that there are those who are trying to tell you, you don't need, no longer need to keep the Sabbath, you no longer keep to keep the law. It's funny, the only, and we'll talk more about this next time, the only commandment people say you shouldn't keep is that, uh, well, one of the main ones is the fourth one. You don't really have people going around telling you, you know, the law is done away with, you can just kill people now. Deuteronomy 31, 26, take this book of the law and put it in the side of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God that it may be there for a witness against thee. It, the law of Moses that was written by him went in the side. So is the love of, uh, is, is, the, is, the, is, the lo is, is, is love the fulfilling of the law? Romans 13, 10 says, love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. So some people say, well, if I just, you hear people say it all the time, if I'm just good to everybody, if I'm a nice person, if I love everyone, then I'll be saved. That's all I need to do. But Jesus says something different. He says, John 14, 15, he says, if you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. We just studied the, which commandments? The Ten Commandments. 1 John 5, 5, verse 1, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the, is the Christ, the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him, that begat, uh, that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and do what? Keep his commandments. We know we love other people when we keep God's commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not what? Grievous. Once you are in Christ, doing what God asks you to do is not grievous. It's like when you're in love with someone and they ask you for something, you delight to do it for them. If you don't delight in doing it for them, maybe something's wrong. You're right there. 1 John 5, in verse 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. You can overcome the world, but you do it in Christ and through him. 1 John 2 and 3, And hereby we do know that we know him, if we keep his what? His commandments. He saith, I know him. He that saith, I know him, 
and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. 1 John 2, 5, but whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know, what, know we that we are in him. He that says he abides in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. How did Christ walk? He kept the commandments. So is Christ the end of the law? These are all the arguments that people say so you don't have to keep the law. Romans 10, 4 and 9, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. So they say, well, Christ is the end of the law. Some people say Christ is the Sabbath. I don't have to keep the Sabbath. He is the Sabbath. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. Verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. This is the process of justification. But it doesn't change that the Bible gives a different requirement. How does it define God's people? Revelation 12 and verse 17, the dragon was wrought with the woman, and went to make war with the who? with the remnant of her seed, which keep what? The commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. How are God's remnant people defined? They have two things. They keep God's commandment and they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Revelation 14, 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The faith of Jesus is how you keep the commandments. Romans 8, 20, Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The cost of sin is death. That has never changed. We are, that's why we, the scripture says that we are ransomed by Christ. We're redeemed. You see, the salary, the payment for sin is death. Just like when you go to work and you punch a clock, and at the end of the day you punch a clock, and after so many days they pay you a check, if you punch the clock of sin, you violate God's law unabashedly, repetitively, and you continue in sin. As you punch the clock, you are building up a tab, and one day a paycheck is going to come. And the wages of sin is death. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. What is powerful is that when Jesus died on the cross, he didn't just suffer the first death. He suffered the second death. And he did it because the wages of sin is death. That means I'm supposed to die. Not just the first death. I'm supposed to die the second death because I violated God's law. What Jesus did is he went to the cross so that the price would be paid for my sin. He died. He paid the price. He collected that paycheck of death. He collected my wages. Died on the cross so that not only could mercy and grace be applied, but so that justice could be fulfilled. That's why I'm a Christian. There's no other religion like this. Every other religion, you've got to work your way into salvation. Christianity is different. The law is held up, but it tells you of your inadequacy. It tells you of your need for him. It reminds you of the price he paid. And that every time we sin, even now, the Bible says we crucified Christ all over again. He has paid the price for you. Let me tell you something. Do not turn your back on the living God. You have no idea the celestial sacrifice Christ made in coming to earth. And let me say it again. If you were the only one on earth who had sinned, he would have left glory just for you. The price that he paid, he, he didn't pay the, pay the price uh, on a collective debt. He paid it on your death individually. It was my hand that held the nail, my hand that drove the hammer. It was my sin that put him on the tree. Would I not live my life for him after that? No greater love is there that a man would lay down his life for his friend. The Spirit of Prophecy says this, Christ consented to die in man's stead, in man's stead that man, by a life of obedience, might escape the penalty 
of the transgression of the law of God. The death of Christ did not make the law of God of none effect. His death did not slay the law, lessen it, its holy claims, nor detract from its sacred dignity. The death of Christ proclaimed the justice and perpetuity of his father's law in punishing the transgressor. In that he consented to suffer the penalty of the law himself in order to save fallen man from its curse. She goes on and she says, the death of God's beloved son on the cross shows the immutability of the law of God. His death magnified the law and made it honorable and gave evidence to man of its changeless character. From his own divine lips is heard, I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill the death of Christ justified the claims of the law. The church, we live in a lawless society. This week, the big talk was what happened at the Oscars. This is a, it's, it's lawlessness on both sides. We live in a society where people make money making fun of other people. Right? And on the flip side, we think now that violence can be justified. And so the big thing blew up and everybody started arguing. To me, I look at it and I just say, society, the very ideal of decency is beginning to evaporate. And what was crazier, two things really made this even show you the need for the law of God in a society. First of all, that's how many people came on and, and on social media and began to defend the violent behavior. Really? So someone says something to you you don't like, you should, as they say in Jamaica, box them? Slap them? Is that the kind of society you really want? And then the apology given at the Oscars by the person who did the slapping. He didn't even apologize to the guy he slapped. He did after when the publicists got involved. But this is what happens when you have a lawless society. Here's what, one of the things that was interesting. Just to kind of go back to our last message, Denzel Washington is consoling Will Smith. And in his uh, speech where he apologized but not to the guy he slapped, Will Smith says, what I loved was Denzel Washington said to me a few moments ago, he said, at your highest moment, be careful, that's when the devil comes for you. But Denzel Washington told Will Smith this as he was consoling him. And I said, whoa, that's interesting. Instantly, there was a backlash to that. This guy, a Spaniard, Pedro Almodovar, I'm sure I said that horribly, criticizes Will Smith's fundamentalist Oscars comments about the devil. Did you see that? So you live in a society that when the devil raises his head and someone calls him out, they're going to say, listen, that's fundamentalist. He said he sounded like a cult leader. Look at this. I'll read some of the, I have some of the stuff from the, from the article here. Alma Devar wrote this, wrote that it was a speech that seemed more like that of a cult leader. You don't defend or protect the family with your fists and know the devil doesn't take advantage of key moments to do his work. Actually, he does. He continued, the devil, in fact, doesn't exist. This was a fundamentalist speech that we should neither hear nor see. Some claim that it was the only real moment in the ceremony, but they are talking about the faceless monster that is social media. For them, Avid for carry-on, it undoubtedly was the great event of the night. Did you see that? I want to I want to submit to you that most of you, by the secular world, are viewed as fundamentalists. And what you believe as a Christian should never see the light of day. In a few weeks, we'll talk about the time of trouble and persecution. But I want you to see that the groundwork for it has already been laid. His response was to me was the most shocking thing in the whole fiasco of the last week. That there is no devil and such talk should never see the light of day. They want a lawless society. Do as thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Let me tell you something, one of the most true prophetic things, when you look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, 
and first five through six, uh, first uh, one through six. When you look at uh, it, it tells you that in the last days, men will be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Lawlessness will reign. It is a prophetic thing that as you see the moral fiber of a society begin to degrade, it is a statement that Jesus is about to return. Here's what it's, this, this, I want to read you the same verse in the Amplified Bible. It says, let no one, uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3, Amplified Version, let no one in any way deceive or entrap you. For that day will not come unless the apostasy comes first. That is the great rebellion, the abandonment of the faith by professed Christians. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, the Antichrist, the one who is destined to be destroyed. Lawlessness. You see, if there's no law, there is no sin. There's no sin, there's no need of a savior. Removing the law of God from society, from the minds of Christians, from the preaching in the pulpit. The idea that if you are a good Christian, it bears the fruit of, of wealth and not the fruit of, 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 of purity and the fruit of, 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 of holiness and righteousness. That is antichrist. We are watching it unfold before our very eyes. In the pulpits across America, they are preaching that really you don't have to keep the law. Your faith will get you a Bentley and a private jet. And they're going to be so shocked when the time comes when they must stand before the judgment seat of the living God. Review and Herald, January 26, 1897 says this. Satan's work in our world today is to destroy the moral image of God in man by making void the divine law. And our enemies are inspired by his spirit. By casting aside God's great standard of character, he can deprave human nature and win men and women to his standard. For where no law is, there is no transgression. With that triumph, then he watches the professedly Christian world as they earnestly do the very work he is doing. As we teach, uh, no moral absolutes. There's no more Ten Commandments. There's no reason to follow what God says. The work we're doing is Satan's work. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 14 says this. Blessed are they that do his commandments that they might have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. We are not able to keep God's law in our own power. God's law reminds us of our inability to keep his law. When we look at the perfect law and read the perfect life of Christ, it, we cry out, woe is me. As Isaiah said, I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. You look at yourself, I don't care how, how Adventist you are, how long you've been in the church, when you really begin to study the thing, you realize how far you are from God's standard and ideal. But it is in that moment when you realize your weakness that Christ becomes strong. It is when we realize our inability to live perfect outside of Christ that we daily seek him, we hunger and thirst after his righteousness. We are transformed in how we study the Bible, how we pray, how we interact with others. It transforms us when we realize we are short of the goal. You do away with the law, you can convince yourself that you've made it. This is a reminder. We are to live as God says live. We're not supposed to tear down God's standard. We're to hold it up. And all those who argue against God's eternal and, and, and everlasting law are arguing against his love because it is his law that, is, that keeps sense of steadiness in this universe. Veer outside of his law and watch what happens. Misery is always the end. I want to challenge you. To study, again, God's word, his law, study the life of Christ. 
understanding that we are at the very edges of time. When we look at what's happening in Europe, when we look at what's happening with the economy, when we look at the comments of the people like the director's words I just said, you realize that time on earth is not much longer. And let me say something, Christians. You do not need to be afraid. But when we see the signs happening, we ought to rejoice for our redemption draws nigh. I'm tired of this world. The death, the pain, the sickness, the wars, the fighting, the starvation, the inequalities and injustices. I want my Lord to return. I want to be ransomed and rescued, redeemed from this world. If that's what you want, I want you to stand with me as I, as I pray. A prayer of consecration over God's church. As every head is bowed and every eye is closed, Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word on, your, on the law, the Ten Commandment law, the moral law. Father God, the law has not been done away with. Thank you for giving us that instruction. It has not been altered or twisted, for Lord, it cannot be changed. Father God, if we work in our own strength to keep it, that won't save us. But we thank you for the law, which reminds us daily, moment by moment, it reminds us of our need for Jesus Christ. That he went to the cross and died the death that we were supposed to die paid the cost of our sin so that, Father God, we would have right to the tree of life and eternal life. There's someone in here, Lord, who needs your Holy Spirit right now. There's someone in here right now who's going through trial and difficulty. Someone right now in here, Lord, who is struggling. Right now, Lord, I claim the blood of Jesus Christ on them. I ask now, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would fill them Lord, I ask that in every one of our lives and every one of our homes and all of our children that you bind the enemy, cast him far away. I pray now, Lord, for deliverance for your people. Give us clear hearts and minds as this world comes to an end. Father God, allow us the clarity to choose you and the strength and courage to stand for you. This is our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Let the church say amen. Amen. You may be seated.